Amen. I invite you to take your Bibles and turn with me to Exodus chapter 19. Exodus 19. Lee uh, led us in a a reading from Hebrews chapter 12, and the reason for that is, as he already said, there's there's a connection in the New Testament book of Hebrews chapter 12, a connection to Exodus chapter 19. The writer to the Hebrews makes reference to what happens here in Exodus chapter 19. Chapter 19 begins... First of all, with the Lord assuring his people. That's what we looked at last Sunday morning. That in verses 4 through 6, the Lord speaks to them and and tells them basically that they are his precious people. That uh, they are special to him. And in doing so, of course, he is preparing them for what he is about to do in chapter 19. That is, he is going to give the Ten Commandments to them. He is going to come down on this mountain called Sinai. And when he comes down, uh, the earth will shake. And so he begins by assuring them of his love and the fact that they are very, very special to him. The next thing I want to say by way of introduction to this passage is that what we have here in these verses is an incredibly significant event. It is a significant event in God's Word. And what I mean by that is this, this preface of chapter 19 and chapter 20 combined, this is another watershed moment. In other words, from the giving of the law here, the rest of Scripture flows in a certain direction. The, the, the storyline of the Bible moves in a certain direction from this point on. And so that when we come, for example, to other historical books like Joshua or the judge, Judges or First Chronicles, Second Chronicles, First Samuel, Second Samuel, First and Second Kings, when we, we move into these history books of the Old Test- Testament, it's all about how the people of Israel were living vis-a-vis this law that was given. And so these other historical books record, in essence, the disobedience of the people to the law that is given here in chapter 19 and 20. When you begin to read the Psalms, there are are countless references in the Psalms to the law. David says, I love your law, O Lord. David writes, the law of the Lord is perfect. It revives the soul. The statutes of the Lord are right. And so, so even in the Psalms, there's this magnifying of how important the law of God is. And of course, when we come to the Old Testament prophets, when we read Isaiah and Jeremiah and Micah and Malachi and Jonah and all of these books, it, it's basically the prophets calling the people back to the law because they have wandered so far away from the law. So this event is a significant event in that it establishes the trajectory of where Scripture goes from this point in time, of course, culminating in the Lord Jesus himself, who was born under the law, but he fulfilled the law in its entirety in both his life and in his death. So this is a very, very important passage What I want you to see in this passage is that there are three main players. There is the Lord, there is the Lord's people, and there is Moses. These are the three main players. God is going to reveal himself to the people. The people are going to tremble in his presence. And Moses is going to serve as a mediator between the people and God. So that's what we're looking at today. So the first thing I want you to see in this passage is that the Lord shows up. The Lord shows up. Allow me to read, beginning, I'm going to start at verse 10. The Lord said to Moses, go to the people and consecrate them today and tomorrow. And tomorrow have them wash their clothes. And be ready for the third day, by the third day. Because on that day the Lord will come down on Mount Sinai in the sight of all the people. Put limits for the people around the mountain. In other words, establish a perimeter, Moses. 
and tell them, be careful that you do not approach the mountain or touch the foot of it. Whoever touches the mountain is to be put to death. Go down now to verse 14. After Moses had gone down the mountain to the people, he consecrated them and they washed their clothes. Then he said to the people, prepare yourselves for the third day, abstain from sexual relations. Now verse 16 is where it all happens. On the morning of the third day, there was thunder and lightning with a thick cloud over the mountain and a very loud trumpet blast. Everyone in the camp trembled. Then Moses led the people out of the camp to meet with God, and they stood at the foot of the mountain. Mount Sinai was covered with smoke because the Lord descended on it in fire. The smoke billowed up from it like smoke from a furnace, and the whole mountain trembled violently. At the sound of the trumpet, as the sound of the trumpet grew louder and louder, Moses spoke, and the voice of God answered him. The Lord descended to the top of the mountain and called Moses to the top of the mountain. So Moses went up, and the Lord said to him, Go down and warn the people so they do not force their way through to see the Lord, and many of them perish. Even the priests who approach the Lord must consecrate themselves, or the Lord will break out against them. Moses said to the people, the, Moses said to the Lord, the people cannot come up to Mount Sinai because you yourself warned us. Put limits around the mountain and set it apart as holy. The Lord replied, go down and bring Aaron up with you. But the priests and the people must not force their way through to come up before the Lord or he will break out against them. So Moses went down to the people and told them. Then we have the Ten Commandments in chapter 20. Go right over to verse 18. Chapter 20, verse 18. When the people saw the thunder and lightning and heard the trumpet and saw the mountain and smoke, they trembled with fear. They stayed at a distance and said to Moses, speak to us yourself and we will listen, but do not have God speak to us or we will die. Moses said to the people, do not be afraid. God has come to test you so that the fear of God will be with you to keep you from sinning. That's an interesting verse, isn't it? Verse 20, be afraid. Don't, don't, don't be afraid, he says. And then he says, be afraid. Don't be afraid, but be afraid. Verse 21, the people remained at a distance while Moses approached the thick darkness where God was. So the first thing we're looking at this morning is that the Lord shows up. And he shows up in a very, very dramatic way. Have you heard of the word theophany before? Theophany is just a word that simply means appearing, but it's not the appearing of anyone. Theoph theophany, T-H-E-O, theo, God, phony, God appearing. A theophany is when God shows up. A theoph theophany is when God comes down and he manifests himself. He reveals something about himself to individuals. It's like having a vision. That's what we have happening here in this passage. So in this passage, we have a theophany of God. We have a picture, as it were, an appearing so that we can see what God is really like. Three things I want to point out to you. These are things that we've heard before, but we need to stress them again in the passage. The first is God is relational. Verse 9, which we didn't read, but if you look at it now, verse 9 says, the Lord said to Moses, I'm going to come to you in a dense cloud so the people will hear me speaking with you. God is going to come down. He's going to speak. Why does he want to speak? Because he wants to be understood. He wants people to hear his voice. He wants to be in relationship with his people. He has just told them in verses 4 through 6, you are my, my treasured possession. You are a kingdom of priests. You are a holy nation. Out of all the earth, I have chosen you. You are absolutely special to me. In other words, he wants to be in relationship with the people whom he has chosen. He is a relational God, and he is not a silent God. He speaks, he communicates, he comes down in order to speak. Later in Deuteronomy chapter 4, Moses would make reference to this when he spoke to the people, and he said, the Lord spoke to you in the fire, in the fire that came down on that mountain. So the people heard the Ten Commandments as God spoke them out. They heard the voice. They heard the conversation that was taking place. You know, we, we often say that the key to a good relationship is 
good communication. Well, that's exactly what's happening here. God is communicating. He saves us for a relationship. But there's more. He comes down in order to be close, but God is not only relational. This passage tells us that God is mysterious. He both reveals himself, and while he's revealing himself, he conceals himself. There, there's a whole pile of these weird things that happen in this passage. Don't be afraid, but be afraid. Come close to me, but don't get too close. And now, God reveals himself, but even as he's revealing himself, he's concealing himself. I'm going to come down to you, verse 9, in, in, in what? In a dense cloud. In a dense cloud. He's revealing, but he's concealing. The psalmist David said, clouds and thick darkness surround you. When, when Isaiah went into the, the, the throne room and the, and, and the throne room and the temple was filled, it was filled with smoke. The glory of God was there. Isaiah saw the Lord, but, but, but what he saw was this dense cloud of smoke, like, like God has this incredible fog machine in which he conceals himself. God is shouted, shrouded in mystery. He is mysterious. One of the big questions we have is, is God knowable? And the answer to that is yes, of course he is. He's knowable. That's, that's why you and I are here today. We, we want to know more about God. That's why he's given us the Bible. That's why he gave us Jesus, because God is a knowable God. He wants to reveal himself, but, but is God Knowable, yes, but we can also say no. Because in a very, very profound sense, God the eternal is unknowable. You and I cannot penetrate into the full godness of God. The Apostle Paul says that he dwells in unapproachable light. Moses here tells us that he is in this dense cloud. So he's relational, but he's also mysterious. Now, the third thing I want you to see is, is really what the whole of the passage is telling us. It's the most important thing. When we talk about God being a mysterious God, a relational God, those are truths we know immediately. Those are truths we have underscored in this series. But now we come to another truth about God, and that is that God is absolutely, get this, dangerous. God is dangerous. He says to Moses, put a perimeter around this mountain. Mountain. I want you to bring the people close, but don't let them touch the mountain. Put a perimeter here. Bring them close, but not too close. Chapter 19. Verse 12, let's read it again. Put limits for the people around the mountain and tell them, be careful that you do not approach the mountain or touch the foot of it. Whoever touches the mountain is to be put to death. Let's go down to verse 20 again. The Lord descended to the top of Mount Sinai and called Moses to the top of the mountain. So Moses went up, and the Lord said to him, go down and warn the people so they do not force their way through to see the Lord, and many of them perish. Even the priests who approach the Lord must consecrate themselves, or the Lord will break out against them. There's a line that we, we, don't, we don't see very often in our Bible. For many of us, there's a line that we would, we would hope wasn't even in the Bible. Verse 23, Moses said to the Lord, the people cannot come up to Mount Sinai because you've warned us. Put limits around the mountain and set it apart as holy. And the Lord replied, go down and bring Aaron up with you. But the priests and the people must not force their way through to come up to the Lord, or he will break out against them. God is dangerous. So we sung of the holiness of God today, and when we think of that, you and I are just thinking of, of him being separate and unique and pure. But it also means that God is dangerous. He's, he's not safe. If you, if you touch the mountain where God is, you will die. Later in Exodus, the Lord will speak directly to Moses and say, no one can see me and live. 
let me put it in this, in this way. God is nuclear. God is like radiation. Last Sunday morning, some of us were woken up early by an alert that came on our cell, our cell, uh, cell phones. It, it went out to cell phones all over the province. It was an uh, emergency alert. And normally that emergency alert is because a child is missing and the details of the child are given so that people can find the child. But this emergency alert was that there had been a leak at the pick, Pickering nuclear power station just east of Toronto. And there was panic. CBC News said that the entire province woke up in fear. Someone tweeted at that point and said, me and probably a couple of million people almost had an aneurysm because of the message. And CBC reported about a a man, a father, um, a family man who lived a few blocks away from the power station named Thomas Perez, who was woken up in the middle of the night by his wife, and she said, guess what's happened? And he said to her, let's get into the car and get out of here. Why? Why such fear about a radiation leak? Because you don't have to be a nuclear scientist to know you don't get close to a nuclear reactor. And if it leaks, you're in big, big trouble because of the effect of radiation. God is nuclear. He is dangerous. You need to put on protective clothing, as it were. If you get too close, you will die. Now, one of the commandments that God will give to the people, it is the second commandment, is that the people are not to make an image of God out of anything physical, and they're not to not only make it, they're not to bow down before it, they're not to worship it. We see this in Exodus 20, and there's a number of reasons for that command. But one of the reasons for the command, and we'll get into this in a couple of weeks' time, but one of the reasons for this command is that no image made by a human being can in any any way adequately describe or portray what God is like. So those of us who are from the Western world, we, we kind of have in our minds this quintessential image of what God is like, and, and that is influenced by, by the Sistine Chapel uh, in Rome, where if you go there, there's this picture of God, and, and God is this white man who is kind of chubby, muscular, but chubby at the same time, and he has a long white beard, and, and, and he sort of reaches out his hand to his creation, the quintessential image. But that's not what God is like at all. You see, whenever God shows up, you never really see his face. When God shows up in the Bible, when a theophany happens, there is this mix of of colors, a mix of sounds, a mix of smoke and fire. When God appeared to Abraham to establish a covenant with him, um, the, the animals were slaughtered, literally cut in half, and, and God appeared in a, in a smoking fire pot. That's the word that is used. Like this orb that is levitating off of the ground, and it is smoking, and it is like white hot, and it moves between the animals. A smoking fire pot. In Exodus chapter 3, when God appears to Moses for the first time, on this very mountain, he appears to him in a burning bush. Our God is a consuming fire. In Exodus chapter 13, we read that the Lord is with his people, and he's he's going with them. He's leading them by a, a pillar of cloud by day, but a pillar of fire by night. And they can see it. Our God is a consuming fire. When God shows up, there's this mixture of things that happen. And here in chapter 19, it is more dramatic than any of the other illustrations that I've just shared with you now. It is more dramatic than all of them combined. In verse 16 through 18, it says, The Lord descends upon the top of the mountain, and the mountain is consumed with fire. The top of the mountain is burning. There is this billowing smoke that is coming off of the mountain. Sue prayed for the Zagala family today as her brother 
Fernando has four or five family members who are living there in close proximity to the Taal volcano, only about 70 to 80 kilometers south of Metro Manila. And this mountain has been smoking for the past week, a mountain and a volcano in the middle of a lake. And do you know the lake has been entirely consumed? It's not there anymore. Can you imagine a lake in Ontario being completely consumed? It's not there anymore. Just a massive hole in the ground covered with smoke. In 1980, Andrea and I went to the Taal volcano. We took a boat out to the island, and there in the middle of the island is this volcano. We walked up the volcano. We could feel and see the steam coming out between the cracks and the rock. But being, you know, youthful and foolish, we went up. But always in the back of our minds, it was like, we want to get close to this thing, but don't get too close. We want to get up as high as we can to look into the crater, but, but we want to make sure that you know, we got a pathway so that we can get out of there really fast if something happens. We wanted to get close, but not too close. I don't know if any of you have seen the video footage of this amazing lightning storm that happened in the midst of the volcano going on. There's some kind of a reaction that happens as, as lava comes up and is spewed and as the ash goes up into the sky that it, 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 it intersects with the clouds and it causes this incredible lightning storm, something like you've never seen before. I think we've all been in lightning storms before, but most of us, our experience with a lightning storm is like we see it way off there in the distance and it looks so wow to us. But have you ever been in a lightning storm where the lightning actually hits beside you or around you? I had a friend, and this happened to him, and he said to me, he says, there was such a loud noise, this this clap that happened, and and the brightness of light, and he said the tree that I was next to was literally hit, and, and pieces of the tree went everywhere like a bomb, like a hand grenade going off. And he said the tree was in flames. You know, when something like that happens to you, you just want to get inside, right? You don't want to get that close. You want to kind of get yourself rubberized in order that the lightning might not touch you in any way because it's raw, awful power. And so we read in verse 18 that the mountain was covered with smoke and it was like a a furnace That's an interesting word that's used there because the only other time this is found in the Bible is in Genesis chapter 19 when God rains down fire on Sodom and Gomorrah. So the Israelites, if they had any knowledge of what happened in Sodom and Gomorrah, and I'm sure they did because Moses would have informed them of this, when they hear this, when they see this, they are jarred immediately because they are thinking judgment is here. It's not safe here. I think all of us know this. We, we know instinctively that campfires we like, forest fires we don't like. We know that we can get so close, we know we can't go all the way. We instinctively know that fire is a dangerous thing. We, we, we saw the video footage, the news footage of what happened in Fort McMurray three years ago. Remember the cars leaving, leaving the city and, and on both sides of the roads, the, the, the trees set alight. And we, we, we wondered how the people even escaped. In the last month, we've been hearing about these bushfires in Australia, and the latest number is that they estimate one billion animals, one billion, not one million, but one billion animals have been consumed in this fire. When Moses went to the burning bush, he was warned, take off your shoes. The land where you're standing is, is holy holy ground, but but this this here in Exodus 19, this is at another level. This is on a completely different scale. God made this mountain his own personal volcano. And when God shows up, this is what happens. There is smoke and fire and thunder and lightning and earthquakes and tremors. When he comes to the tabernacle later in Exodus and he fills it, with his glory, the same thing happens. It's, it's filled with smoke. When he comes and fills the temple, when Isaiah has his vision of the throne room of God, again, it is filled with smoke. When Jesus is crucified in Jerusalem, there is an earthquake that happens. When the Holy Spirit comes at Pentecost, there is a violent rushing wind and tongues of fire that sit upon the heads of the apostles. 
And in Revelation chapter 4, where John is given this vision of the throne, there's lightning and peals of thunder and this mixture of incredible, incredible colors. Look at verse 17. Look at verse 17. Verse 16 ends with, everyone in the camp trembled. Verse 17, then Moses led the people out of the camp to meet with God. Like you want to say here, Moses, what are you doing? Are you crazy? Don't take the people there. But he does. Because he wants them to see this. And he does this because God wants us to come close to him. But at the same time, not too close. Listen, it's clear from this, from this story, from this passage, that, that God wants us to come close, but he is absolutely dangerous. So the question that immediately is in our minds is, well, how do we get close to God if he's so dangerous? God shows up. And the next thing we see in this passage is that, the, is that the people shake. Verse 16 says it, everyone in the camp trembled. If you go over to verse of chapter 20, verse 18, it says they trembled with fear. It, it, it's put here twice to underscore the people shaking, as it were, in their, in their boots, in their sandals, as it, as, as it were. This thing looked frightening. It, 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 it sounded fearful, and it felt like that as well. And according to verse 18, even the mountain itself trembled. I mean, this, this, this massive a hunk of stone that protrudes out of the desert floor. It seems unshakable. It seems fixed. It seems unmovable. And even the ground itself trembles. So let me ask you, as you came in to worship this morning and you took your seat here and you thought about God, I hope you did, did you tremble? When you think about God, do you do you, do you tremble? Now, what we're seeing here is, to be very frank, not the usual way we think about God. It's not the way our contemporaries, our contemporary world thinks about God. It, it, it's not the kind of reaction that, 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 that most people have today. It's not the kind of emotion that most people feel. When was the last time that you trembled at the thought of God? You see, we live in an age where we, <laughs> we see God more as a personal friend than we do as a supreme deity. We live in a day and age, and we're influenced by it, where we're very, very comfortable with a user-friendly God versus a majestic, holy, dangerous God. And the result is, is that when we worship, we have a casual approach to worship. I'm not talking about the style of worship. I'm talking about our attitude in worship. We kind of come into this place, and I'm gen generalizing here, but generalizations are generally true. A and we come into this place, and we kind of we come in like we're coming into a friend's house, and we're just going to you know, put up our feet on the coffee table in the living room, as opposed to having an audience with the queen at Buckingham Palace. Let me say this to you, and I, I, can't, I can't muster up the force that this statement needs. We are more comfortable with God than we ought to be. We have forgotten how dangerous God is. The people shook. But even though they're trembling, Three times in this passage, God speaks to Moses and he warns Moses to warn the people, don't touch the mountain. <laughs> They're seeing this in front of their eyes. And some of them are still foolish enough to touch the mountain while it is blazing. You see, God understands what you and I are like. We're like little kids who've been told, now don't touch the burner on the stove, right? You, you, we all get it, right? What do you want to do immediately? Little kid, what do you want to do immediately? Oh, mommy said I shouldn't touch it, and we want to touch it. We read statements like adults only, <laughs> and if we're young, uh, we're going to do it anyway. 
we are foolish because we are rebellious. And God knows that we cannot grasp, we cannot grasp just how vast is the gulf, is the chasm that exists between him and us. And so three times he warns, don't touch or you will die. Listen, there is a great chasm between God and us. People don't think there is. You may not think there is. You think, oh, God's close. You know, God's my pal. God's my buddy. I talk to God all the time. God and I are good. But there is a great chasm that exists between us and God. And the scripture says in Hebrews, it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. As I prayed this morning, I, 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 I was just, I really was overcome with a sense of inadequacy and unworth, unworthiness in being able to convey even a modicum of what the people experienced here on this mountain. Let me make another sta- statement at this point in time. Every single one of us, every single one of us, without fail, is presently underestimating the holiness of God. He is not a God to be trifled with. On Mount Sinai, God spoke to God. God spoke to the people, and they trembled. I think John Calvin is one writer who has has adequately captured the truth of what is happening here. He writes, the sinner will never be capable of pardon until he learns to tremble from consciousness of his guilt. Nay, until confounded with dread, he lies like one dead before the tribunal of God. And unless there is a deep conviction in our hearts of our own sinfulness, we we cannot begin to grasp the good news of grace in Christ, the good news of the forgiveness of sins, until we have deeply felt our own unworthiness and the gulf that exists between that, he who is holy and we who are unholy. All of the gospel truth that we hear is just words. There has to be this conviction, not just a fleeting thought, oh, yeah, yeah, I know I'm not perfect. I could be better. I make many mistakes. No, 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 no. But a profound, an absolutely profound sense of how offensive and hurtful our actions and our words and our thoughts have been to a holy God before before whom we will all stand and give an account. Friends, this is the only view of God and ourselves that makes sense of this passage. The problem is this. If we are left to ourselves, we can't get close. We can't get close to God. So how can we get close to God? The next thing I want you to see is Moses and his role. The Lord shows up. The people shake And now Moses steps up, literally, and he steps down. Have you seen it all through the passage? Moses goes up, he talks to God on the top of the mountain, God gives him some words, he comes back down, he tells the people, he goes back up, he comes back down, it's over and over again. Seven times it happens here at the mountain that Moses goes up and Moses comes down. Why is this here in the passage? Why this emphasis on Moses being the one to convey? God could have just spoken to the people direct. God didn't need a mediator, but a mediator was needed. And they were to get ready to meet with the living God, and they needed a mediator. The call went out, you know, abstain from sexual relations, wash your clothes. Why, was, why are those commands given there? Is God against sex? No, that has nothing to do with it at all. But God was saying through Moses, I just want you to set aside everything else, everything else. Like, don't get consumed with your love for, for your wife or your husband. Like, 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 don't get caught up in that. You are going to meet with me. So just abstain to prepare yourself to meet with me. And wash your clothes, it says. Moses is the mediator. He was the the one, he was the go-between. He's the one in this passage who bridges the gap between the holy and the unholy. 
Moses was absolutely, his role as prophet and meteor was absolutely critical. Three things about Moses. First of all, he conveyed God's word. And we see this all through Exodus. He's the one who speaks. He, he's the one through whom God speaks to give the regulations for the Passover. Uh, he, he's the one who tells them what's going to happen with the manna and what they're supposed to do with the manna. And here in chapter 19, he's conveying God's word to the people. People need to hear from God, but they can't hear direct because you can't get too close. You need a mediator to convey the word to you. Secondly, he, he calls on God all through the passage. He's, he's calling on God all through Exodus. He's calling on God on behalf of the people. He is the one who represents the people before God, and he represents God before the people. When the people needed water in their journey, it was Moses who cried out to God. When they grumbled against him and against God, he's the one who calls out to God that God would have mercy on them. And when the Amalekites come and attack, attack them, it's Moses who's lifting up his hands. He's the, the one who intercedes. He is the mediator. And here on Mount Sinai, he speaks to God and he speaks to the people. And the people in verse 9 hear this audible voice. This was God's way of authenticating Moses as his spokesman, as his prophet, as his, as his mediator. He's keeping the communication open. And the next thing I want you to see, verse 14, is that he consecrates the people. Exodus 19, verse 14, after Moses had gone down the mountain to the people, he consecrated them. It doesn't say they consecrated themselves. It says he consecrated them. What does that mean? How could Moses consecrate them? Now, they were told to, to wash their clothes, to abstain from sexual rela relations, but, but there's more that needs to happen here. There's some kind of a consecrating act that needs to take place. There's something that Moses has to do in order to make the people holy and able to approach this mountain. It is not enough to just wash your clothes. They need God to make them pure, and in order to be pure, they need the agency of a mediator. And so Moses consecrates them. Now, the Scripture does not tell us here exactly what he did, what exactly this consecrating act was, but I would suggest to you that it was some kind of a sacrifice that was given at this point in time. There's already a precedent for this because at the Passover, a sacrifice of a lamb had to take place in order to save the firstborn sons of Israel. There had to be a sacrifice who would be a substitute for the people. And his role then as mediator was to offer this sacrifice to consecrate the people to make atonement for the sins of the people. Listen, friends, you and I think we don't really need a mediator. We can come directly to God. No, you can't. There is no human being who can come directly to God. If you do, you will die. You need a mediator. And the only mediator who can bring us to God in this story was Moses. So how does this relate to us, and how do we respond to it? I want to share with you three takeaway points from this mountain, okay? You ready? Put your seat, seat belts on. We're going to go fast. Number one, God has not changed. Now, some of you are hearing this, you're saying, yeah, yeah, but John, John, this is the God of the Old Testament. And the God of the New Testament isn't the same. Wrong. Totally wrong. The God of the Old Testament is no different than the God of the New in the end of the book of Hebrews, a New Testament book, it says, our God is a consuming fire. He is, not was. He is a consuming fire. I am the Lord, God says. I do not change. God has not changed. He still wants a relationship with us, but he's still nuclear. He is still unapproachable. And if you and I desire to feel the wonder of his grace and close communion with him, then we must first feel the terror of his holiness. God has not changed. Number two, the people have not changed. People in general have not changed. You know, we like to, we like to think that, you know, somehow humanity is getting better. Um, no, we're not. 
We're not getting better at all. We are still unholy. We still need to be consecrated. We are, we are in danger. We are like, listen, friends, you and I are like tissue paper close to a campfire. And in Exodus 19 at Mount Sinai, God gives this visual aid to underscore these two truths. God has not changed. The people have not changed. He also gives this, this visual aid to illustrate that God is inviting us to come close to him, but we can't get close to him. God is telling us that he desires a relationship with us, but we have a problem in that God is absolutely holy and we can't establish the relationship. So how do we have a relationship with God from whom we must separate ourselves? So we go to Hebrews chapter 12. Will you turn there fast, please? Hebrews chapter 12, the passage that we read earlier today, an incredible passage. Hebrews chapter, chapter 12. Now I want you to keep this word in your, in, your, in your mind. It's the word mood. Mood. What's the mood here of this passage? I want you to feel this. I want you to feel the mood. Okay, look at verse eight, 18. He's talking to us, believers in Jesus. You have not come to a mountain that can be touched that is burning with fire to darkness, gloom, and storm, to a trumpet blast. This is Exodus chapter 19. Or to such a voice speaking words that those who heard it begged that no further word be spoken to them. That's what they said in chapter, chapter 20. Moses, you be the one to speak. Don't let God speak directly to us. You've not come to that mountain, he's saying here. Verse, tw verse 20, because they could not bear what was commanded. If even an animal touches the mountain, he must be stoned to death. The sight was so terrified, terrifying that Moses said, I am trembling with fear. It wasn't just the people, it was the mediator himself who trembled with fear. Look at verse 22. But you have come to where? To Mount Sinai? No. You've come to a completely different mountain. You have come to Mount Zion. You have come to the city of the living God. You have come to the heavenly Jerusalem. You have come to thousands upon thousands of angels in joyful assembly. Do you catch the difference of mood? On the one mountain, it's gloom and storm. On this mountain, Mount Zion, it's joyful assembly. Do you realize that at the beginning of Exodus chapter 19, in this whole story of God meeting with his people through Moses, that the word that is actually used there to describe, one word, to describe the whole thing is the word assembly. It is the first use of the word congregation. It is the first use of the word gathering, meaning the corporate gathering. All of God's people gathering together in one place at Mount Sinai to worship God. Now the word is used here again, and it's called joyful assembly. Look at the next verse, verse 23. You've come to the church of the firstborn, whose names are written in heaven. You've come to God, the judge of all. You see, he's still a judge. He hasn't changed. But you've come to the spirits of the righteous made perfect. You've come to the church of God that is at rest. The saints of God who are in heaven, who have rested from all of their labors. Isn't this amazing? Do you, do you realize that as you came through these doors this morning, you entered in this place? I'm not, I'm not trying to say that this, this sanctuary, this auditorium is, is, some, is some holy place like, like a temple in Jerusalem. I'm not, I'm not saying that. But wherever two or three are gathered in my name, Jesus says what? I am there in the midst of them. When, 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 when God's people gather like this on a Sunday morning to worship, we've come to Mount Zion. We've come to the heavenly Jerusalem. There are angels all around us as we worship. We are intersecting with this unseen realm, and, and, and God is here. We don't come with this, with this absolute fear that we're going to be consumed. Why? Look at the next verse. Verse 24. We have come to who? To Jesus, you see that? The mediator 
of a new covenant and to the sprinkled blood that speaks better than the blood of Abel. (laughs) Do you realize that the writer here has gone from Exodus chapter 19 all the way back to Genesis chapter 4 at the murder of Abel by his older brother Cain? And what happens in Genesis 4 when Cain murders his younger brother Abel? When he murders his brother, God says that the blood of Abel cries out from the ground. What's the blood of Abel crying out for? Justice. Justice. Just like you and I cry out constantly for justice, When all of the wrong goes on in our world, the blood of Abel cries out for justice. But this word says, Hebrews 12 says, that the sprinkled blood speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. If Abel's blood cries out for justice, then the sprinkled blood of Jesus cries out and says, justice has been served. Justice is fulfilled. Because when Jesus Christ died on that cross, he took took the just and righteous judgment of God upon himself and justice for every sin was dealt with at the cross when God justly dealt with the sins of the world in the person of his son, Jesus. And so that Jesus is now the mediator of a new covenant, and we come to this joyful assembly to worship God. Listen, Moses had to go up, and he had to come down. He had to go up, and he had to come down. He had to go halfway up the mountain, and God had to come halfway down out of heaven to meet him on the mountain. But when Jesus came, he came into this world, and he lived among us, and he died on the cross for us, and he rose again from the dead for us, and he ascended into heaven And there he remains. He didn't just go halfway. He went the full nine yards. And he stands before a holy God, our God who is a consuming fire. And there he mediates between us and God. And he says, these are my blood-bought children. And therefore, because justice has been done in the death of Jesus, you and I can stand free. And we have wonderful, beautiful access to the Father. This is why I love Sunday morning so much. Because I come with you, the members of the church of the firstborn of God, and I know that I'm not just worshiping with you, but there are angels all around, and I'm worshiping with them. And I know that I've also come to the spirits of just men that are made perfect, that there is the church of God in heaven, and we're all worshiping together, and I can come and worship God here, and I don't have to worry that me, just a little piece of tissue paper, will be consumed in his presence because my mediator Jesus and his sprinkled blood speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. So, so, what do we do? Let us worship God with reverence and with awe because our God is a consuming fire. Please stand. Lord, how can these truths be conveyed accurately, acceptably, adequately? How can these truths be received in the same way? We need your help. And you have said that we are those who are the true circumcision, who worship God by the Holy Spirit. And so we ask for his help. And we also pray for hearts that are overwhelmed with gratitude for all that you have done for us in Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, the one whose sprinkled blood brought justice and made it possible for us to come into your holy presence. Accept our praise and help us by the Spirit to worship you with reverence and with awe. Hebrews chapter 12, 
uh, ends with a warning. And the warning is about something in the present and something that's coming in the future. Listen to these words. See to it that you do not refuse him who speaks. That's right now. That's the present. It's in the present tense. Refuse him who speaks. Not him who spoke, him who speaks. He speaks now. This God on the mountain continues to speak. Don't refuse him who speaks. If they did not escape when they refused him who warned them on earth, how much less will we if we turn away from him who warns us from heaven? And in the future, at that time his voice shook the earth, but now he has promised once more, I will shake not only the earth but also the heavens. The words once more indicate the removing of what can be shaken, that is, created things, so that what cannot be shaken may remain. There is a day of shaking coming when the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, and there will be a trumpet blast when he comes, and he will bring the nations to judgment. And if we have refused to listen to the one who speaks to us right now, then on that day, we will be with all other created things, and we will be consumed by the righteous and glorious anger of the holy Lord God Almighty. But we have heard his voice, and we have listened to him who spoke to us. Haven't you? Haven't you? I hope you have. And in hearing his voice, you've opened your heart to him to receive not only his words, but him. And if you haven't, please do today. Please. We beg you, do it today. And for those of us who have heard his voice and obeyed him, it says, we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. So let us be thankful. And so worship God acceptably with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. Amen.